In today's video on clinical reasoning, I'll be introducing the topics of test selection and hypothesis refinement. I say this is just an introduction since I'll be revisiting these later in the series. While it might seem premature to introduce these topics without first discussing an appropriate mathematical foundation in biostatistics, they are nevertheless introductory skills with which beginning learners will be expected to have some familiarity in a qualitative way. However, a more robust quantitative understanding will come later, particularly during part three of the series. When seeing a patient with an unknown disease, the choice of diagnostic test depends upon the test performance characteristics. Classically, this includes the test sensitivity and specificity, but at least as important are its positive and negative likelihood ratios for the disease under consideration. Beginning learners are definitely not expected to know these values off the top of their head, but experienced clinicians should be able to give a qualitative estimate for the most common findings in the most common diseases they encounter. Other factors include the risk of harm from the test itself. While some tests, such as blood and urine tests and ECGs and ultrasounds, have near zero risk, the harm from tests involving radiation, sedation, or an invasive procedure, such as bronchoscopy, endoscopy, and angiography, can be significant. The cost of the test is another consideration, both the out-of-pocket cost to the patient and the cost to the healthcare system. One needs to consider the relative availability of different options. For example, for an acutely ill patient who comes to the ER on a Friday night, a pretty good test, done right away, is preferred over the perfect test that's not available until Monday morning. And the last important consideration is patient preference. Influenced by the aforementioned considerations are three basic strategies to test selection. When considering a strategy, ask what are you trying to accomplish with the test? With a confirmation strategy, you select the test whose characteristics might rule in your leading diagnosis. For example, ordering a transthoracic echocardiogram in a patient with a prosthetic heart valve and staph aureus bacteremia. A positive TTE would definitely rule in the diagnosis, but a negative TTE usually would not rule it out. With an elimination strategy, you select the test whose characteristics might rule out a relatively unlikely diagnosis. This is usually done for so-called don't miss diagnoses, a plausible diagnosis that's unlikely, but potentially rapidly fatal if missed. A common example of the elimination strategy is ordering a D-dimer test to rule out a pulmonary embolism for a patient in the ER with chest pain. The third test strategy is discrimination, in which a test is selected for its ability to discriminate between two or more equally likely diagnoses. For example, performing a lymph node biopsy in a person with fever, weight loss, and a large cervical node in whom the major diagnostic considerations might be lymphoma versus tuberculous lymphadenitis. In addition to a decision about which test or tests to order, there is one more decision to make, whether to conduct a sequential approach in which one test is checked at a time, and the next test is only ordered if the preceding ones were insufficient at ruling in a single diagnosis, or to conduct what is sometimes referred to as the shotgun approach, in which multiple tests are checked simultaneously. These approaches can refer either to situations in which tests A, B, and C are all investigating the same disease, or to situations in which tests A, B, and C are investigating competing diagnostic possibilities. Each approach has advantages and disadvantages. The sequential approach is cheaper for outpatients, though it results in relatively higher harm from potentially delaying a diagnosis. The shotgun approach may or may not be cheaper for inpatients, since it results in more tests, but in some circumstances may result in a shorter hospital stay. The shotgun approach has a relatively higher harm from iatrogenic injury related to testing. And an unappreciated problem with this approach is that it comes with greater risk of diagnostic confusion. This refers to the fact that the greater the number of simultaneous tests that are ordered, the higher the likelihood of a false positive particularly when some of those tests are investigating diseases of low pretest probability. A classic example of this last problem is when a patient presents with a multi-system disease that feels vaguely rheumatologic or infectious in origin, 
and the clinician responds by simultaneously testing a dozen autoantibodies and serologies for a dozen different infections. Neither of these approaches are the right or wrong way to practice medicine. While the sequential approach is more elegant and more consistent with limiting cost and iatrogenic injury, the more acutely and or seriously ill the patient is from an unknown diagnosis, the more appropriate the shotgun approach will be. Regardless of which strategy or which approach a clinician chooses for a particular patient, one should not order a test unless it will change management. For example, if you are convinced a patient has pneumonia and would treat them as such regardless of whether a procalcitonin level was elevated or normal, then don't order a procalcitonin level. Although this statement is very commonly repeated by healthcare professionals around the world, it should be accompanied by a tiny asterisk here because there are rare cases in which a test might not change the clinician's medical management, but might still provide useful prognostic information to the patient or their family. For example, imagine an elderly person with dementia who presents with symptoms and signs suggestive of some type of advanced cancer. Even if that patient's family would not want the patient to receive cancer treatment, knowledge of a cancer diagnosis might impact advanced care planning enough to justify a non-invasive test that could relatively easily rule in or rule out the diagnosis. But this is an uncommon exception to the general principle. So now, how do we apply a test result to our hypothesis? That is, how do we revise our differential diagnosis? This requires an estimation of the pretest probability of the relevant disease or diseases. I haven't really talked yet about the concept of pretest probability in this series, except in passing. I'll talk much more about it in parts two and three, but for now, in brief, as the term suggests, this is the probability a patient has a disease before a given test result is known. The probability of the disease after the test result is known is called the post-test probability. Qualitatively, the higher a patient's pretest probability was for having a disease, the higher their post-test probability will be following a positive test result. So for one patient with a relatively high pretest probability, that post-test probability will be high enough to rule in the diagnosis, while for a different patient with a lower pretest probability, the same exact positive test result will not rule in the diagnosis. Unfortunately, this phenomenon is ignored far too often in practice. Once again, it will be discussed more later in the series. The revision of the differential diagnosis also obviously requires an accurate interpretation of the test itself. It requires knowledge of the test's performance characteristics, that is, the positive and negative likelihood ratios, as mentioned before, including an appreciation of the possibility of false positives and false negatives. And last, it requires the recognition of when a test result may be inaccurate. Inaccurate test results is a subtype of and not synonymous with false negatives and false positives. For example, a normal AM cortisol level in a person with adrenal insufficiency may be a false negative, but not because it's a test error per se, but rather because a one-time cortisol level is just not a good test in general for the disease. But sometimes there is a problem with a specific patient's test, and that is a test error. Such test errors may result from a problem with the sample collection, for example, seeing an extremely low sodium level in a patient whose blood was checked downstream from an infusion of IV fluids. There could be a problem with the test assay in the lab, and the test could have been collected or resulted on the wrong patient. A clinician should consider the possibility of an inaccurate test if either the result is inconsistent with the patient's presentation or physiology, or if the result is markedly different from a recent test in the same patient without explanation. For example, an asymptomatic hospitalized patient who is noted on their ECG to have a sudden dramatic shift in their QRS access from one day to the next, that person's ECG probably has a limb lead transposition, that is, a mistake made by the person recording the ECG. Having said that, you should never assume an unexpected test result is an error. And if there is any doubt, just send the test again, assuming it's not unusually dangerous or costly to do so.
Today's key takeaways. Considerations when choosing a diagnostic test include test characteristics, risk, cost, availability, and patient preference. Individual tests can be selected to confirm, eliminate, or discriminate diagnoses. The overall approach to testing can be sequential, meaning one test at a time, or shotgun, meaning multiple tests at a time. And last, applying test results to revise the differential diagnosis requires estimation of the pretest probability, accurate interpretation of the test, knowledge of the test's characteristics, and an ability to identify a possible inaccurate result.